On this videotape, we will be discussing restorative and rehabilitative care. There are several purposes of this module. The first is to discuss rehabilitation and restorative care and how it promotes independence and patient potential. Next, we will re review the goals of restorative care. We will discuss the responsibilities and the role of the home care giver in rehabilitation. We will demonstrate how the in-home care provider can promote self-care for the patient. We will list those activities that make up the activities of daily living. We will explain common comfort and adaptive devices that are used to compensate for motor and sensory loss. We will identify complications of inactivity, both physical and psychological, that affect the restorative or rehabilitative potential of the person that you're caring for in the home. First of all, we're going to discuss disability. Disability is a physical or mental condition which interferes with meeting Maslow's basic human needs. In one of the other modules, we discussed Maslow, a behavioral psychologist who outlined the needs that every human being had in order to live a full life. The effects of disability on Maslow's hierarchy of needs begin at the bottom with the first level or the need for food, water, oxygen, and elimination. Disability also affects the individual's self-esteem, a higher level on Maslow's hierarchy, and also the inability to meet, meet the top level or self-actualization. Restorative care helps disabled individuals return to their highest level of functioning. This includes both physical functioning as well as psychological functioning. Restorative care assists the individual in adjusting to their disability. It emphasizes what abilities still remain and de-emphasizes the focus on those abilities that the person no longer has. Restorative care also focuses on preventing complications. We must remember that restoration and rehabilitation begins when an individual first becomes ill or disabled. And we want to intervene at the earliest possible moment in order to prevent any further deficits. There are two goals of restorative care. The first is physical, and the second is psychological. The physical goals emphasize maintenance of a present level of functioning. In other words, maintaining those abilities that the person has. The second goal under the physical classification is to improve and restore physical function. And the third, and probably most important, is to foster independence and performance of self-care activities to preserve the individual's self-esteem. Psychological goals include adjustment to effects of disability, which may be devastating. It is necessary for the individual to stabilize their economic resources because as many of you know, illness or injury can drastically drain financial resources. One of the goals in this phase is to identify and connect with community resources, social services within the healthcare organizations, within the county, the state, and the federal system, to look into job development and rehabilitation if the person is going to return to the workforce. 
If someone suffers a disability or illness and is unable to return to their job, then their role in life is seriously compromised. This can lead to depression and despair. Offering someone job rehabilitation, perhaps in another field where their abilities can be used to the highest level, is an important phase of rehabilitation. And financial planning is necessary for those people in order to manage their disability throughout their lifetime. Now, you are a caregiver in the home. There are certain responsibilities and roles that you have assumed by accepting care for the person that you are looking after. The first function you must fulfill is to evaluate the level of current functioning. This includes the physical capabilities of the individual as well as the psychological capabilities. Psychological capabilities cannot be emphasized enough because without initiative, motivation, and the will to improve, other phases of rehabilitation cannot be successful. Next, you need to set goals for rehabilitation. And we have to be careful that these goals are realistic. Remember when you learned a language for the first time, initially you learned simple words, words that you needed in order to basically function. It's similar when we go through rehabilitation with someone who has become disabled. We need to look at those functions which are absolutely required for them to live in a fairly normal way on a daily basis. We also need to realize that improvement cannot come immediately, and these goals must be realistic. We must crawl before we can walk, and we must walk before we can run. We want to evaluate progress and adjust our plan of care to achieve our goals. We must be realistic in looking at, are the goals realistic for this particular person? What is their optimal level of functioning? Obviously, we cannot restore function which has been lost in earlier times. Next, your role is to determine who is going to be involved in the care. You, as the caregiver, do not need to be the one to take on all of the responsibilities. There may be others in the household or within the community that can assist in the rehabilitative effort. You, though, need to be the leader of the team. You need to assign tasks and roles to those people that are willing to help and are competent to help. Look for outside resources. Remember, in order to maintain higher levels of self-esteem, an individual wants to interact with their environment and with friends and relatives outside the home. Be sure, however, that you observe the interaction with those other individuals. Even though Aunt Bessie may be a wonderful nurse, bossy Aunt Bessie might not be the best person to take care of mom. You, as the primary in-home care provider, can make that determination. And you may need to gently say to Aunt Bessie that although her efforts are very much appreciated, that perhaps her visitation needs to be limited. Also observe interaction with the other caregivers that are perhaps hired from outside the home. These include those people that come in to provide cleaning, cooking, and other care. Be very observant as to the interaction between your loved one and the caregiver. If there seems to be hostility or unwillingness. Be attuned to that and make changes as necessary. Be sure that the care is coordinated to lessen fatigue, both mental and physical, for both the person you're caring for and for yourself. You need 
recreation and rehabilitation also because the chore that you have taken on is a very large and awesome task. And finally, you as the primary caregiver need to observe for any complications and be sure that these are reported to a physician. Now let's discuss how the in-home care provider can promote self-care for the patient. And that is something we are talking about, self-care. People do not readily accept being invalids or incapacitated. It makes them feel childish. It affects their self-worth. Although you may feel as though you're helping by doing everything for the person you're caring for, you are only doing them a disservice. Your first duty is to protect their rights, and the right that is most often violated during the rehabilitative restorative phase is that of privacy. Privacy in regards to financial affairs, privacy in regards to mail that might be coming or other communication and phone calls. If someone is receiving mail, be sure that you open it in front of them rather than open it ahead of time and give it to them once you have sorted through it. This gives them a feeling of control over the communication that is coming into the home. Do the same for phone messages. Even if a telemarketer should call, be sure that you do take down the number and share it with the person you're caring for. After all, it is their home and it is their decision whether they wish to talk to the individual. You also need to ensure safety. Patients that have had some areas of brain injury may lack the ability to judge things accurately. As a result, they are very prone to hazards, particularly slips and falls. So you need to preserve safety in the environment. And we have discussed some of the alterations to be made in the home in order to maintain that safety. Ensure therapeutic communication, not gossip, particularly in the presence of the person for whom you are giving care. Remember, just because someone may not be able to speak does not mean they are unable to hear. And just because they have difficulty hearing doesn't mean that they are unable to respond appropriately. Adhere to the legal and ethical principles that we have discussed earlier in terms of theft and abuse issues. Follow the instructions of physicians, therapists, pharmacists, and other members of the team. You need to then implement rehabilitative measures as ordered. These might include assistance with mobility. And we have already discussed some of the assistance that you can give when someone is unable to move independently. Assistance with meals, bathing, dressing, and hygiene. So important to maintain an individual's self-esteem. And assistance in movement of their joints and muscles, which is also called range of motion. Encourage independence. Be sure that you praise progress and set limits. Set limits on yourself and set limits on the individual. No one can spend all day working hard. Each of us needs time to relax and laugh and enjoy the companionship of others. Provide emotional support and reassurance. And lastly, learn to use all equipment knowledgeably. And one of the things that you will learn in this video, as well as others, is how to use equipment in the proper manner. Now let's discuss some activities of daily living, or as healthcare professionals refer to them, ADLs. 
These include daily hygiene, grooming, eating and self-care activities necessary for us to normally function in society. Grooming begins at the top, and this includes clean and combed hair. Also, giving good eye care so that there is not um, debris in the eyes or in the nose. Dressing so that one feels presentable when they are meeting visitors coming into the home or they are going outside of the home. Feeding so that proper nutrition is assured. Hygiene, particularly after toileting. Elimination of the bowel and bladder. And mobility, both mobility in bed and mobility out of bed, into a chair, or into walking. There are also common comfort and adaptive devices that are available to assist in all of these ADLs or activities of daily living. Comfort devices when someone is in bed include something as simple as pillows, rolls of towels in order to maintain proper body alignment, foot cradles to keep the blanket off the toes so that pressure is not exerted and bed sores do not form on the toes or the heels, rolls of towels placed along the side of the ankle so that the ankle does not turn outward and become painful, hand rolls to prevent contractures or shortening of the muscles and permanent formation of a fist. Bed cradles and footboards so that the foot may be exercised and foot drop does not occur. A sheepskin or other similar device placed on the bed to prevent decubiti or bed sores, which are discussed in another one of our videos. Heel or elbow protectors to provide protection against friction on the sheets. And special beds, which provide protection of pressure points and prevent skin breakdown. Some of these special beds have been discussed in other videos and include flotation pads, egg crate mattresses, water beds, alternating pressure mattresses, which alternate air between tubes in the mattress, and a clinitron bed, which is filled with silicone beads to prevent pressure from building up against the bony prominences. Remember, however, that pillows, an inexpensive, easily found adaptive device, is one of the best methods to position someone in bed or in a chair. We also have adaptive self-help devices that provide assistance during eating. These include cuffed or swiveled utensils to prevent spillage from the plate to the mouth, plate guards that one may push against when eating, plate holders or cup holders to prevent the cup or the plate from slipping out of the way of the person who is eating, and other adaptive utensils. And we will demonstrate some of those later in our presentation. There are also grooming aids to assist with hair brushing, brushing of the teeth, and cleaning of the body. These include long-handled combs and brushes. And one of the best devices which one can get for someone in the home is an electric toothbrush that allows the teeth to be thoroughly cleaned with a minimum amount of movement of the hand. There are also communication aids that can help someone interact with the outside world. These include boards, such as those that are erasable 
either a chalkboard or a whiteboard so that someone can communicate in writing if they're unable to speak. A communication board should be tied to the chair if someone is up in the chair. It should be at the bedside. It should be on the table where they eat. It should be by the television where they may watch soap operas. And it should be in the bathroom. More than one